We hear an awful lot of so-called prophetic voices these days, particularly when it comes to the church. I don't know if you noticed this. People love talking about the church, and they love talking prophetically about the church, and usually what they have to say goes along the lines of, well, the church is no longer relevant. Uh, The church is in decline. The church has had its day. The church is doomed. Actually, these aren't godly prophecies at all. These are worldly prophecies. Secular voices. You read them in books. You read them on social media. You hear them in the news. Read them in the papers. And, And there's always a big danger that we allow these voices to start influencing the way we think about things. So we, we start thinking, oh, maybe they're right, you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe the church is a thing of the past. Maybe, what's the point? You know, there's no point in mission. Let's just, let's just sort of, let's just pull up the drawbridge and we'll just look after ourselves. And as long as there's a church while I'm still alive, whatever happens after that, I don't mind. You know, it's that sort of negative, doom-laden way of thinking. That's what happens when we listen to worldly voices. And there were lots of worldly voices around in Jeremiah's day too. This is about 7800 BC. And there are worldly voices talking about the future of Israel and, and, and Jerusalem and the temple. Oh, you know, its, it's glory days are gone. Um, it's a spent force. Um, you've had it really. You've, you've really. If you look around at all these huge empires that are growing up and Assyria and Babylon, what chance have you got to, in, you know, against any of them? You know, you've had it really. Worldly voices. But as we'll see, I hope, that there's a big difference between worldly voices, worldly prophecies, and godly prophecies, godly voices. And over the next four weeks, we're going to be focusing on godly prophecies, and in particular, the prophecies he gave uh, through the prophet Jeremiah. And I hope we'll see a big contrast between God's voice and the world's voice. So Hazel's going to read our lesson for us today. Where's Hazel gone? Oh, there she is. Whoa. Um, It's from Jeremiah chapter 18, and it's the first 10 verses. It's titled, At the Potter's House. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. And now shall we pray. Loving Father, Open our ears to your voice and our hearts to your message for us today. Come Holy Spirit, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I think one of the first things that passage demonstrates for us is that God can speak to us through images as well as through words. There's Jeremiah. He's just got up, probably, he's had his breakfast, he's looking out over the city walls, and he gets a nudge from God. The Holy Spirit says to him, Jeremiah, I think you should go down to the potter's house. So off he goes down to the potter's house. And there he sees the potter fashioning a vessel made from a lump of clay. Laura's left her pot behind, actually. I didn't realize that. I'll just quickly grab this. He's, he's fashioning. And clearly he has a, a, um, in his mind what it is he's fashioning. He thinks, oh, I think I'll make a jug today, or I think I'll make a pot, or I think I'll make a, a bowl or something. So he's, he's working away. Hands up if you've ever done pottery. It's great fun, isn't it? It's really quite fulfilling. Anyway, so he, there he is fashioning away 
this pot, but something goes wrong in the process. It, it's not true to what he has in mind. So at that point, what does he do? Well, he doesn't, he doesn't take the pot, and say, oh, doesn't take the clay, and say, oh, that, that clay is rubbish. <laughs> I, I'm not going to use that clay anymore. I'm going to use this clay and, and, and start again. He doesn't do that at all. Instead, he does what any potter does. It's when, when it doesn't quite turn out as he planned, you, you break it up into a lump. And then you start again. I'm not going to do it right now, by the way. I'm going to do it, finish it later on. I'll leave the lump there as an illustration. And um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah senses that, that this is God's message that he wants him to speak to the Israelites. And the message is quite a simple one. Uh, it's things are in a mess. Things aren't quite turking, turning out as I had hoped. But God hasn't given up on you. God has not given up on you. And if you're willing to let him, he can start again. And he goes on to say, in that particular chapter, uh, it's interesting actually, something that never struck me before is, if God is the potter, then the signs of clay will be on his hands. God's hands are connected to us if we are the clay and he's the potter. Because they're all over my hands. I can't get it off. I didn't get a chance to go and wash it off like those boys did. But maybe there's something there. God's hands have clay on them. But anyway, if you follow that up and read the end of the chapter and read some of the following chapters, you'll see that um, through Jeremiah, God goes on to say, if you want to begin again, you've got to stop relying on your idols. You're just going to have to stop relying on... On, on these gods that you brought from the other nations around you. You're going to have to stop relying on your alliances with these other nations. You're going to have to stop relying on your, your treasures and your, your, your treasure store. You're going to have to stop relying on your city walls. You're going to have to start relying on me. And you're going to have to turn back to me so that I can fashion you again into something great. That's what God's saying. And so there we begin to see the difference between godly voices, godly prophecies, and worldly voices, worldly prophecies. Worldly voices are all about doom. You know, the end is nigh and you've had it, you might as well give up and crawl into a hole. That's, that's worldly prophecy for you. Godly prophecy, it may well have words of warning in it, but by and large, it's all about encouragement. It's all about hope. I have not given up on you, says God. Turn to me, and I can reshape you into something great again. So here's the question. If godly prophecy is all about words of warning and encouragement, what might God be speaking into our lives today? What might God be saying to our society today? What might God be saying to our church today? What might God be saying to us today? We could start with society. Why not? Because in many ways, society today is a bit like society in Jeremiah's day. We too have our idols. Things that we have put our trust in. And three of them come to mind straight away. Idol number one, technology. Technology. We hear about climate change. We hear about poverty. We hear about all sorts of things. We say, don't worry, technology will fix that. After all, we've got AI. We've got drones. <laughs> we've got the social media. You know, we, 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 we've got the capacity to fix that. So that's one idol I think we put our trust in. Another one is democracy. Oh, now I can see you're getting nervous here. But... Um, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with democracy. It's a good thing, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect. As long as a government is democratically elected, what could possibly go wrong, we say? What could possibly go wrong? And then there's scientific advance. You know, it's been over 100 years since people have been saying, science is going to cure all the world's sicknesses and illnesses and diseases. Over 100 years. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with the, with the way science works to find cures for these things. But it's not going to cure everything. Our net NHS today is struggling. Our newspapers are full of extreme actions being taken by democratically elected populist politicians. And AI, AI and digital media, it does a lot of good, but sometimes it doesn't work, does it? Sometimes it does more harm. And I'm reminded again and again of the story of the Tower of Babel. You know that story where, and it's based on this premise that human beings have the capacity to become God. You know, we don't need God anymore. We can do it ourselves. And yet, the lesson of Babel is, well, we can't. <laughs> we can't. Despite our technology, despite our democracy, despite our scientific advice, we can't do it ourselves because we are fallen. We are sinful. We need God to direct our lives. We have no real hope without him. Without God, things just end up in a big mess. In a big mess. And what might God be saying to his church today? Well, you know, we've got all these worldly voices going on about decline. And, and often the response to that is, no, we're not in decline at all. And we put our, 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 our energy into being busy. What we need to do is we need to be active in our community and we need to be active politically and we, and we need to get involved in mission and be outward looking. And all of these things matter. All of them. They're important. They're necessary. They're vital if we are to survive into the next generation. But I was struck last week by something Jim Simbola said when he wrote it in a book I was reading. How he preached once on Mark chapter 3 where Jesus is appointing the 12 disciples and then sending them out to do his work. And he begins by calling them to his side so that they can spend time with him. And after they've spent time with him, then he sends them out to do his work. In other words, whatever God is calling us to do, and there's plenty to be done, plenty to be done, it has to begin with us spending time with him. It has to begin with that. If you think about it, you see that pattern repeated throughout the New Testament. I mean, the classic example, Acts chapter 2. There's the disciples. The risen Jesus had a chat with them, explained everything to them. They know all about why he died, why he rose again. They've got it all up here. And they know that their purpose is to go and make disciples of all nations, to, to spread the gospel. But they still can't do it. They have to wait. In God's presence. Ten days of non-stop prayer. I'd love to have been there in God's presence. And then the Holy Spirit comes in power and they go out and the news spreads all over the world. But it begins by spending time with him. We cannot engage with our community on our own. We cannot be social activists on our own. We cannot engage in mission on our own. We have to recognize that we can only do it in the power that God gives us. And so before we do anything, we have to spend time with him. And what can be said for us as a church can also be said for us as individuals. You know, personally, my biggest enemy has always been busyness. Ask any minister. Ministers have always got far too much to do. Far too much to do. And there's a the big danger that we constantly have to guard against that if we spend all our time doing all that stuff, we might be neglecting the most important thing. Remember the story of Mary and Martha? Who was it that had remembered the most important thing? It was the one who spent time at Jesus' feet. I know from experience that if I'm not spending time at Jesus' feet, then slowly the joy goes and the, the energy goes. You know, if you're, ever, if you're ever just doing your best for God, you know, you're, you're really involved in everything, you're up to your eyes in it, your head's spinning, and you notice that the joy's gone. Well, that's a symptom of 
not of burnout, but you're not spending time with him. You've got to begin with him. The Sabbath begins, the week begins on a Sunday. You know, we, we, we have to start with God. And then everything else flows from that. You know, the last time we looked at this passage from Jeremiah was back in May 2020. Hands up if you can remember what we're doing in May 2020. We were all sitting at home because of lockdown. Uh, This building was empty on a Sunday morning. We're all going out wearing masks. We're all, um, we're watching, we're trying to worship together online. So I looked back, I thought, well, what did, what did I feel God was saying to us then through this passage of Jeremiah chapter 18? And it was fairly straightforward. The message was that God hasn't given up on you. Now, that was something we had to hear back in the COVID time. I mean, it's, we forget so easily what it was like. You know, that sense of, oh, is it going to be me next? Is it going to be my loved ones next? Oh, who do I trust? You know, all that sort of stuff. It was scary times. But God hasn't given up, given up on us. And the other thing that I drew from the passage was, you know, lockdown may have been rubbish, but it did teach us things. It taught us the value of worship, being together, serving God together. Lessons that I hope that we still learn today. So that was back in 2020, but what about today? What's his message for us today? Well, I think it's, I mean, obviously he still hasn't given up on us. He's still got our clay on his hands. But we are undergoing a time of reshaping just now. We are. We had a vote last week. All part of the reshaping that is going on just now. You know, that whole process that we've been engaged with in this area over the last two and a half to three years now, rethinking What sort of church does God need to serve the people of South East Edinburgh? That's what we've been doing. In the face of all these worldly voices saying, decline, decline, doom, doom, you're finished, you're finished. Of course, the temptation, there was a group of us, you know this, there's a group of us, three from each church, we all met together on Zoom at first and then eventually in person to, to, to share and to talk about these things. The temptation at first was always to, well, 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 you just carry on, we'll just do our own thing, you know. The pull up the drawbridge temptation. You know, I think we're doing fine. You can sink or swim. And that's a very worldly response to all of this stuff. But we very soon realized that's not what God was calling us to do. What was God calling us to do? He was calling us to think firstly of Jesus. When you think of Jesus, what do you think firstly? You think of sacrificial love. God was calling us to display sacrificial love to each other. And that, that could be costly, but that's God's way. And so we came up with that covenant, that document of trust, saying we are going to be one church, we are going to work together, we are going to share resources, and we are going to engage in God's mission. And we came up with that because that's what we believe God's will is for this area. His will is for this area to flourish, for the church to flourish, for Jesus' name to be lifted high. So God is reshaping us just now so that we can do that. And we need a bit of reshaping so that we can do that. We are the clay and he is the potter. And you know, that message was reinforced totally unexpectedly. I mean, it shouldn't have been unexpectedly, really. But at the time, for me, it was totally unexpectedly. My head was all buzzing with presbytery planning. You know, our team meeting, I'm not allowed to use the presbytery planning phrase anymore. People don't sit beside me at our staff meeting anymore because they're so bored of having to play, pray about presbytery planning. Because we go around the staff meeting and say, what would you like prayer for? And I go, presbytery planning. I think, oh, I'm not sitting beside him. <laughs> so there I was all the time. And then we, we had, a, we had our, our Tuesday evening prayer gathering. Now that's for everyone to join in. And we do it on Zoom during the winter so you can join us online with, with your devices and stuff like that. 
And then after Easter, we'll move into, round about after Easter, Alistair, we'll move into the church and we'll do it in person. But we always begin with a time of thanksgiving, a bit like we did a couple of Sundays ago, where um, I think it was Laura went around and asked people, is there anything you want, you're thankful for? And we all share it. And we, we say thank you to God for it. And then before we start praying for each other, we have a time of listening. What is God saying to us? Maybe there's a bit of music playing. And it was during that time of listening that God gave a prophetic image to one of the people who was on the Zoom call. And afterwards, in a very quiet, humble voice, she shared the image with us all. And it was an image that sort of blew our minds, given all the reshaping that's going on at the moment. But it was an image of the church building and a river, a river of life running past the door, bringing life to the whole community. Prophetic image. God still speaks today. Words of encouragement. Words of hope. God hasn't given up on us. He's reshaping us for what's to come. But if we want to be part of it, if we want to be any use to him, we must first be willing to spend more time with him. That is a given. So let's do it now. Time of silence. What are you saying to me, Lord? What do you want me to do, Lord? Let's do it right now. It might be a long time of silence. I'm just warning you now. Let's just spend some time with him. We thank you, Father, that you still have our clay on your hands and that you've not given up on us. And so we need to be willing for you to reshape us as individuals, as a church, so that we can be used for your glory, your glory alone. And so we offer ourselves to you with humble hearts. Please take us and break us and mold us and fill us and use us for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name.